Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad you made it out on this snowy morning. It is a beautiful day for those of us who enjoy watching it come down. For those of you who don't, just stay home, turn your TV on, get ready for the football game. Either way, God has blessed us this day, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Our Old Testament connection for today comes from Psalm 119, starting at verse 105 and following. By your words, I can see where I'm going. They throw a beam of light on my dark path. I've committed myself, and I'll never turn back from living by your righteous order. Everything's falling apart on me, God. Put me together again with your word. Here ends this first reading. Thanks be, Thanks be to God. Let's lift our voices as we sing our first song this morning. of the children of God, let us pray as Christ taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our primary scripture for today comes from Luke chapter 7, starting at verse 1. I'm reading from the message. When he finished speaking to the people, he entered Capernaum. A Roman captain there had a servant who was on his deathbed. He prized him highly and didn't want to lose him. When he heard Jesus was back, he sent leaders from the Jewish community asking him to come and heal his servant. 
they came to Jesus and urged him to do it, saying, He deserves this. He loves our people. He even built our meeting place. Jesus went with them when he was still quite far from the house. The captain sent friends to tell him, Master, you don't have to go to all this trouble. I'm not that good a person, you know. I'd be embarrassed for you to come to my house, even embarrassed to come to you in person. Just give the order and my servant will get well. I'm a man under orders. I also give orders. I tell one soldier, go, and he goes, another come, and he comes. My slave, do this, and he does it. Taken aback, Jesus addressed the accompanying crowd. I've yet to come across this kind of simple trust anywhere in Israel. The very people who are supposed to know about God and how God works. When the messengers got back home, they found the servant up and well. Not long after that, Jesus went to the village of Nain. His disciples were with him, along with quite a large crowd. As they approached the village gate, they met a funeral procession. A woman's only son was being carried out for burial, and the mother was a widow. When Jesus saw her, his heart broke. He said to her, Don't cry. Then he went over and touched the coffin. The pallbearers stopped. He said, Young man, I tell you, get up. The dead son sat up and began talking. Jesus presented him to his mother. They all realized they were in a place of holy mystery, that God was at work among them. They were quietly worshipful and then noisily grateful, calling out among themselves, God is back, looking to the needs of his people. The news of Jesus spread all through the country. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. I want to give thanks to everyone who continues to support the ministry here at Hope United Methodist Church. Your continued support enables us to meet the needs of the people around us, to continue to serve God in faithful ways. For those of you who are here, the offering plate is in the back of our worship space. For those who are watching online, we invite you to mail your offering in at the address that is listed, or to bring it into the church and slide it under the church office door. Let's continue to give our praise to God as we sing.
keep our hearts joined together as we pray this morning. God of mercy and God of healing, we are grateful for your presence in these days where we see your hand at work in those around us and in those that we can see only from a distance. We pray, O oh God, that you would lay your healing hand upon those who are near and dear to our heart right now. We pray for George, Nova, Neil, Marvin, and George again. We pray for our leaders. We pray for a world and nation that is still discovering and trying to find its way through all that is before us from military aggression to the continued instances of this global pandemic. We pray for those who have reached the end of their means and are fearful of what it means for their future, how they will provide food for their families, and heat in their homes. God, it has been a long time, and we cry out to you for relief. We pray for everyone to be understanding with one another, to find grace and mercy instead of blame and anger and hatred. We pray for your church to be a model, to be a vision of who Jesus is in the world today. We pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> the faith of the least and lost. As a pastor in the church, I often hear people talking about the faith of the faithful. The faith of the strong remnant. The faith of the church, the faith of true believers, as we reach out to the least and the lost. I find it interesting that in our churches today, more often than not, we seek out the least and the lost as persons completely separated from us, who have no connection at all with our God, with our Savior, with our Holy Spirit. Yet in the passages that we read this morning uh, from Luke, the, the, the uh, primary character apart from Jesus is a person that the church would call least and lost. Yet even by Jesus' own words, who was the one who expressed faith that he had not found in any true believer? I call the church for a moment of repentance in thinking that somehow we're the only ones that have it right. I have found more faithful people in their ability to witness to the love and grace and mercy and forgiving power of God among those who are outside of the church than in more often than I want to admit. Who believe in the power of prayer who believe in the healing power of God, who believe in God's ability to sanctify even from a distance, who are more humble than even those who sit in our pews on Sunday mornings. This passage is one that I believe is not one where Jesus is calling us to seek out the least and the lost, but rather turning it around just a little bit and saying, at this moment, the least and the lost are those who are following me, not the one who is at a distance from me. Jesus finished speaking to the people. He entered Capernaum, and a Roman captain there had a servant on his deathbed. 
and he sent the Jewish leaders to go talk to Jesus. Isn't that great? A person outside of the church went to the elders and the preachers and the church leaders of his community to go talk to Jesus on his behalf. And the, these leaders came and they meet with Jesus and they say, this man deserves you to hear his plea because he cares about us. Folks, is our church and your church so deeply ingrained within the community that those who are considered least and lost by our standards believe that they can come to us in their time of need for help. This Roman leader does not believe that he is good enough to come to God by himself, but he goes to the leaders of the community that he is in with to ask for help. Is your church so integral to the community that you are located in that those in the community who are even outside of the church feel they can come to you in their times of need? For some of our communities, the church definitely is. For others, well, the real question is, if your church closed its doors, would it affect anyone or anything? And is your church supported by those outside of the community sitting in the pews in such a way that what happens to them affects you. You see, we are told as believers in Jesus Christ that we are in the world, but we're not to be of the world. That means we are to be engaged in what is happening around us. We are to be engaged in the lives around us because what happens to those around us affects us personally. Old Testament does the same thing when they're in exile. Pray for your oppressors, pray for your persecutors, and pray for the foreign land you're located in because its welfare is a reflection on your welfare. In essence, we're not called to separate ourselves from the world. We're called to be engaged in the world in such a way that people see the movement of God as a benefit, as a support, as an image of hope. Even when they feel unworthy, they know that they can come to the church to approach what they feel they are not holy enough to approach themselves. Jesus began to move toward this Roman captain's home, and while he was still quite a ways away, the captain can somehow see or be informed that Jesus is coming. And so he sends another group of people to Jesus saying, please don't come to my house. I'm not good enough. I still have laundry laying on the floor. The children's toys are laying out. The front yard has not been picked up from the animal droppings. And, and I don't want you to come to the house. It would be an embarrassment for me. And it would be an embarrassment for you. Just know that I know that you've got the power from there to affect my life over here. Has the church allowed itself to be so powerfully used by God that we are a blessing for people, even if they're not sitting in our sanctuaries and our gymnasiums? Has the church allowed itself to become so intricately attached to the power and the work of God that within the community it's located in, it is a blessing even from a distance to its neighbors? I'm not talking about once a month providing food. I'm not talking about once in a great while having the Easter egg hunt or the 
like the night at Halloween or anything like that. I'm talking about that every day people know that that church, that community of believers is praying for them. And if there is a need, that church is going to show up. And even if they're not welcome to come to the face of that person, can send help. In the midst of life's greatest challenges, I've sat in communities and worked my way into the lives of those around me and heard words like this. Oh, you're the pastor of that church. Boy, does that word have a whole lot of loaded meaning to it. They're the ones that fight with each other. They're the ones that fight with our community leaders. They're the ones who told my child they weren't allowed there because they were too loud. They're the ones that told my sister to get out of the church because she got pregnant out of wedlock. They're the ones who glare at my mother because, or they won't have anything to do with my father because. And my question is, folks, the reality of everyday life is that none of us are worthy of standing in the presence of God on our own. But somehow, when we allow ourselves to be dumped, sprinkled, or poured over, we suddenly think we are superior. I have found persons of stronger faith outside of the church at times than I have found inside. And I'm not the only one. So did Jesus. This man sent another group and said, Look, I know what it's like to be the leader and to be one who is led. When I am told to go and do, I go and do. And when I tell someone else to go and do or come, they do. And so I know that you, as the Son of God, can say, Be healed, and you don't even have to come. You don't have to be embarrassed by standing in my presence, and I don't have to feel unworthy of having you in my presence. I've yet to come across this kind of simple trust anywhere within Israel, the people of God. The very people who are supposed to know about who God is and how God works. Folks, we who have grown up in the church should know this, yet we somehow still have bought into this idea that there is a superiority between us and our way of living and our way of acting, and we somehow try to impose our expectations for our life on those who don't know God in the same. And as a result, we attack the very people that we are called to serve and be with. This was a Roman official raised in the belief of Roman gods, not Yahweh. It may very well be that his only knowledge of God is what he has learned in the short time of living in the community, watching and witnessing the actions of those who say they believe in God. And he wants to support that community even though he's not a part of it. He believes that there is this God who has an impact on these people's lives doesn't say that he has a belief in that God is his own personal God. And Jesus doesn't go up to him and say, you need to bow down before my God before I'll do anything to you. No. Jesus says, here's a man of faith outside of the community of faith who shows more belief in what God can do than those who stand 
and the synagogue, the temple, and the church. Jesus doesn't try to impose a belief on him, but rather accepts him and his belief that he has at this time where he's at. The faith of the least and the lost cannot be discredited, folks, because the faith of the least and the lost may be even stronger than some of those who sit in the front row of you. And also the ones who sit in the back row. I've yet to come across this kind of simple trust anywhere in Israel by the very people who are supposed to know who God is. The messengers, when they got home, found that the servant had been healed from a distance. The story goes on, and we're not told much about this woman other than that she is the widow of Nain, or the woman in Nain, and her son has died, and Jesus gives a command. I like this because here in the previous part we have a, a Roman official who says, I give orders and I receive orders, and in the very next story, Jesus gives an order. Get up! He didn't touch the man, he touched the coffin. Get up! And the man sat up and began to talk. Then Jesus presents him to his mother. You see, folks, this is a holy mystery that we don't get. How can God work with those who are unholy? Remember, the man's dead. Dead bodies are unclean. Jesus raises him from an unclean state to a living state. It's a holy mystery. We don't know how it happens. We don't understand how baptism happens. We don't understand how communion happens. We don't understand how Jesus died and came back to life again. We don't understand because dead is dead. Unclean is unclean. Yet somehow God is able to overcome the boundaries that we try and put in place. Each and every time. The faith of the least and the lost perhaps needs to be found in the church again. Psalm 119, the words that we read earlier, By your words I can see where I'm going. They throw a beam of light on my dark path. And I've committed myself. I'll never turn back from living by your order. Everything's falling apart, God. I have to trust that you will put me together again with your word. And Jesus spoke, and his servant was healed. Jesus spoke, and the dead were raised. Jesus calls, and we must go. This is the faith of the least and the lost. Amen? Amen. Today we celebrate communion. We are reminded in John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He didn't send his son into the world that the world might be condemned, but that through him the world might be saved. It is a promise that goes beyond our understanding. Jesus is not just the Savior of the church. He is the Savior of the world. And when he calls, the sick are still healed. The dead are still raised. And the living are called to repentance. Let us pray. Almighty God, 
Forgive us when we allow our human understandings to become weapons of faith against others. Forgive us when we have used your words as a means of attacking another. Forgive us, God, when we take our understanding of denominational affiliation as superior to any other believer's Forgive us, God, when we believe that by your blood we are better than any other child made in your image. As we come now to sit at your table, remind us that we gather at your table with brothers and sisters of other human beings across ages, across generations, across genders, across nations, across race, across language. Because we have a faith of one who has been lost, one who has experienced being least, and one who has experienced the love of Jesus Christ. Forgive us, God, where we have failed, and celebrate with us where we have succeeded, and help us, O oh God, to always seek after you. Amen. Almighty God, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, gathered together both in person and in virtual settings that through the Holy Spirit we would be joined to one another in the love of Jesus Christ, that we would be made one in mind, one in service to you and the world. Through your Holy Spirit, make these gifts of bread and cup be for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we may be the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, and sent into the world with a gospel message, so that the feet who bear good news may be welcomed. O oh God, make us so integrated into our community that our faith knits us together, believer and unbeliever, in service to you. Amen. The bread that we break is a breaking of the body of Jesus Christ. We who are many are still made one. The cup of blessing the shedding of the blood of Christ again reminds us of the removal of sin so that the sin of death may pass over us and we may be welcomed into life. Amen. Take heed and drink.
We have gathered at the table of God. We are children of God, made in the image of God. Let us reflect God so clearly that God's love cannot be denied. Amen. Let's lift our voices as we sing our closing song. discredit the least and the lost having faith. Instead, may we celebrate the faith in God we find everywhere we go and give praise to God for it. Amen. <laughs>